matter how you view American history, it is pretty clear that the U.S. is no stranger to war. Now, some people may disagree on what exactly the most important war the U.S. ever went through was. Some people may say the American Revolution, some people may say Vietnam, some people may cite the War on Terror, but for me, the most important conflict the U.S. ever went through was the Civil War. The American Civil War remains to be the bloodiest war the United States has ever fought. From 1861 to 1865, it is estimated 625,000 to 850,000 people were killed and that over 400,000 were wounded. The battle between the northern states of America and the southern states of the Confederacy is one of the most defining struggles the nation has ever faced. It put brother against brother, swords against guns, and would decide the fate of millions of innocent people bound in chains still at the boots of privileged masters. Great men rose and great men fell. Poor and grief-stricken men and women from both the North and the South could face off against each other on the bloody battlefields as the questions that were left over from the American Revolution finally had to be answered. I am Mr. Fedora, and this is the American Civil War. <laughs> Ever since the end of the 18th century, when our founding fathers helped declare the 13 colonies free from British imperialism, slavery had always been an issue discussed by many people as America became its own nation. While the founders of our nation were only human, and did both good and bad things throughout their lives, one of the few criticisms they face when it comes to their history of running the nation is that many of them owned slaves. In fact, according to author and historian John Green, many slaves left their plantations to fight for Britain due to the possibilities that if they survived the war, they would become free men under UK law. The Three-Fifths Compromise, made by the very people who drafted the Constitution to the United States, essentially stated that African Americans born in the nation were little more than property. Shortly after the American Revolution came to an end, northern states started to outlaw slavery one at a time. By 1787, the U.S. Congress of the Confederation passed the Northwest Ordinance outlawing any new slavery in northern territories, and by 1794, the country had cut its ties with the slave trade. Over the years, anti-slavery legislation would continue to be passed in northern states and even some founding fathers, ironically, some of whom still owned slaves, called for an end to forced servitude and the violation of human rights. Two of these included at the time President Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Vermont was the first state to ban slavery. In 1777, the constitution of the state abolished forced servitude, and the state was admitted into the Union in 1791. Before any state seceded from the Union in the 1860s, the states of Maine, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Oregon, and California had all abolished slavery. However, from Virginia all the way down to Florida, the economy of the southern states was heavily dependent on farming and working in the fields, in contrast to the northern states' attempts at industrialization. This made slavery much more popular in the southern states in order to exploit individuals for free labor while also avoiding economic collapse. No state in this area of America, which is sometimes known as the Bible Belt, had outlawed forced servitude. Though, there is more to what caused the Civil War than seeing which states had outlawed slavery and which did not. It was clear, especially in the early and mid-1800s, that the issue of slavery would continue to plague the future of the U.S. as the nation expanded to the Pacific Ocean in the Manifest Destiny. In 1854, in response to the Missouri Compromise that regulated slavery in America's developing western territories, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed. 
This act not only created the territories that would later go on to become two official states of the country, but also allowed white male settlers to determine whether or not they would allow slavery in the developing land. While some supporters of this bill in Congress thought that this act would help ease the ongoing tension between abolitionists and supporters of slavery, instead, both pro- and anti-slavery elements erupted into Kansas. This eventually resulted in the conflict that became known as Bleeding Kansas. Bleeding Kansas began in 1854 as debates between both sides started to escalate as to whether or not Kansas should enter the Union allowing slavery, but eventually this erupted into open violence which began in October of 1855 with a man known as John Brown. Brown was an abolitionist born in Connecticut who believed the only way slavery could come to an end in America was through armed insurrection. By the end of November, a pro-slavery supporter had killed a quote-unquote free stater in the Kansas Territory. Violence continued to get worse, and John Brown responded to this by murdering five supporters of slavery in May of 1856. Afterwards, Brown and many of his sons began plans to raid Harper's Ferry in Virginia. He wanted to start an armed slave revolt by gathering access to the U.S. arsenal and encouraging violent opposition to forces that were pro-slavery. On October 16, 1859, the raid began, but by October 19th, Brown's raid had failed and he was captured and tried for treason. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging on December 2nd. John Brown went to his death with no regrets, and famously proclaimed in his last words at the gallows, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. While John Brown remains to be quite a controversial figure in American politics to this day due to his violent acts against people during his rebellion, many state that he was a heroic martyr who was not afraid to die in order to free innocent people who were trapped in miserable lives under the power of brutal landowners. The one thing that nobody can deny, however, is that John Brown was a key figure in the events that led up to the Civil War due to his lean positions in Bleeding Kansas and Harper's Ferry all preludes to the armed violence that would erupt due to the opposition against slavery. Another event that made many abolitionists believe the U.S. federal government was in favor of slavery in addition to the Kansas-Nebraska Act was the 1857 decision of Dred Scott v. Sanford. Scott, a slave who was taken by his owners to free states, sued for his freedom. In a 7-2 decision, Scott was denied his sovereignty, and the court case basically established that slaves, regardless of whether or not they were in free territories, had no rights compared to the majority of the population. Though another result that took place due to the Kansas-Nebraska Act that would be the final straw was the 1860 presidential election. After the act was passed, the Republican Party was formed as a movement to end the expansion of slavery. 1860 would mark the 19th presidential election for the United States, and the Republican presidential nomination for the race was a former Illinois congressman known as Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln grew up on the western frontier of Kentucky and Indiana, and was a self-educated man who would later go on to become a lawyer and a member of the now non-existent Whig Party. He then became a member of the Illinois House of Representatives before being elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1846. Lincoln promoted the rapid modernization of the economy, but had trouble gaining re-election from Illinois voters due to his opposition to the Mexican-American War. He returned to Springfield, but went back into politics in 1854 when he helped build the Republican Party. Lincoln became very well known for his heated debates with his rival, Stephen Douglas, when he ran against the Democratic candidate for Congress. He lost this race, but by 1860, Abraham Lincoln had secured the Republican nomination for President of the United States. Against Southern Democratic candidate John C. Breckinridge, Constitutional Unionist John Bell, and Democrat Stephen A. Douglas, Abraham Lincoln won, achieving the best popular vote and electoral vote. He won with almost 40% of the vote, which was over 1.8 million and 180 electoral votes. However, not a single southern state had voted for Lincoln. 
With an elected president who strongly opposed slavery, the results that took place in Kansas and Harper's Ferry, and the fact that most of the economy relied on slaves in the South, southern states began to oppose the North more than ever, and on December 20th, 1860, South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union. Before the first battle began, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas would join South Carolina and form the Confederate States of America. With states ready to split apart from the American government, and ready at all costs to defend what they viewed as their way of life, war between the North and the South was inevitable. officially began on April 12, 1861 after the newly formed Confederacy fired upon Fort Sumter in South Carolina. The CSA was hoping to take the fort from U.S. forces, which they believed belonged to Confederate soil. U.S. forces refused to evacuate Fort Sumter, and on April 12th, at 4.30 in the morning, the Confederacy began its bombardment. By the end of the so-called battle, U.S. officer Robert Anderson agreed to evacuate due to his forces being heavily outgunned. No lives were lost on either side, but this event sparked the Civil War, as the Union began began its campaign to defeat the Confederacy and reclaim the southern states, and the South replied with armed resistance to protect what they viewed as their way of life. After Fort Sumter, the states of Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina also seceded from the U.S. government and joined the Confederate States of America. Lincoln called upon 75,000 volunteers to help stop the rebellion. As the Confederacy continued to gain support, the official constitution of the CSA was adopted on May 11, 1861, and would remain in effect until the end of the war. Jefferson Davis, former Secretary of War and Mississippi Senator, had gained popularity from many states in the South, and easily won the position of President of the seceded nation. He was inaugurated on February 11, 1861, and chose Georgian politician Alexander H. Stevens as his Vice President. They were the Confederacy's first and only Presidents. Richmond, the capital of Virginia, became the capital of the Confederacy in contrast to Washington, D.C., the Union's capital. As the Union organized to attack the South, many believed that the war would be over quickly. The United States had a population of 22 million, while the Confederacy had only 9 million, about 3 million of whom were slaves. The Union also had a much more advanced economy, with an abundance of weapons, and the North also maintained a much higher percentage of manufactured goods. The U.S. also had more than twice the railroad length of the Confederacy, which could make transportation much more easy for the Union. Some people even went as far as to have picnics on the hills overlooking the battles to see what they viewed as the beginning of a swift and quick victory for the North. However, when the first official battle of the Civil War began, things did not go exactly as everybody expected. After Lincoln ordered a naval blockade around the southeastern sea border to cut off supplies, Confederate forces were pushed out of Union strongholds in the North, mostly in the border states. The border states included Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and later, West Virginia, which did not exist at the time. These states remained loyal to the Union, but allowed slavery still. On July 21, 1861, Union forces faced off against Confederate forces in full battle for the first time in Fairfax County and Prince William County in Virginia. This was the First Battle of Bull Run, also known as the First Battle of Manassas. Both sides had about 2,000 poorly trained soldiers, however, the Union side was very disorganized during battle, which allowed for Confederate reinforcements to arrive by rail and, amazingly, defeat the Northern forces. This battle is where famous Confederate General Thomas Jonathan Jackson earned his nickname Stonewall for standing his ground in the face of Union attacks. Bull Run was would become a message to everyone that the war would continue for a long time, much longer than anybody else would expect. 
It is believed that one of the reasons the North suffered great defeats from Southern forces is because while the Union did have just about every advantage when it came to resources, the Confederacy had much better generals. This is where many famous Confederate military leaders, who will be discussed later, earned their titles as some of the most impressive generals in U.S. and C.S. history. In February of 1862, Union General Ulysses Simpson Grant took Forts Henry and Donelson in Tennessee, driving Confederate forces down south. He then carried his army further south, but all the while, Southern General Albert Sidney Johnson was planning a surprise attack against his Union enemy. On April 6, 1862, the surprise attack came in the form of the Battle of Shiloh, which took place in Hardin County, Tennessee. The battle was brutal. Over 3,000 men died, one of them including General Johnston himself. President Davis would go on to state that the death of Johnston would be a turning point in the Confederacy's fate, at least in the Western theater. The Union won, one of the reasons being that Northern reinforcements were able to push the Confederacy out of the battle despite the CS's successful attempts on the first day. The battle ended on April 7th. Grant's success here would earn him a decent reputation when compared to other Union generals who were failing to quell the rebellion. One survivor from the Confederate side of Shiloh was a lieutenant general named Nathan Bedford Forrest, who would later become the first Grand Wizard of the white supremacist terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, after the war ended. For six days from April 25th to May 1st, 1862, Union Naval Officer David Glasgow Farragut successfully captured New Orleans in the Confederate state of Louisiana. He had successfully fought past Fort Jackson and Fort Phillip earlier, so New Orleans was captured practically unopposed. Meanwhile, in the Eastern Theater, infamous Union General George Britton McClellan began a plan to capture Yorktown in Virginia and move on to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. McClellan had previously been building up and training a large army to face off against the rebellion, but in terms of his actual commanding and fighting during battles, many historians consider him to be an inept leader of an army that could never really successfully defeat the Confederate forces. As May began, McClellan advanced with an army of 100,000 men to Norfolk, where Confederate forces evacuated. But on May 31, 1862, the Battle of Seven Pines began in Henrico County, Virginia. McClellan's forces faced off against Confederate General Joseph Eagleston Johnston's, and the battle ended with the North severely damaging their enemy, even if the invasion to the capital was halted by the next day on June 1st. However, by the end of June, McClellan's army would be driven out of the South in the Seven Days Battle, which took place in both Henrico and Hanover County in Virginia from June 25th to July 1st. Confederate forces managed to outflank and successfully damage the Union Army, and while McClellan did manage to retreat to safety, his campaign to take Richmond had failed, and his army had suffered almost 16,000 casualties during the week-long battle. The Confederate general who drove McClellan out of the South was a man you may have heard of, Robert Edward Lee. While many believe Lee's dedication to the South was more due to his loyalty for his home state of Virginia, he is perhaps the most iconic human symbol of the Confederacy, and is one of the most respected generals in U.S. history. He served in the Mexican-American War, and was one of the military leaders who successfully defeated John Brown during the Harper's Ferry Raid. After the war, he would go on to become the president of Washington and Lee University until his death in 1870. Over a month later, on August 9, 1862, the Battle of Cedar Mountain in Culpeper County, Virginia began. Here, Stonewall Jackson's forces drove back Nathaniel P. Banks' army from advancing into central Virginia, mostly thanks to a counterattack. By the end of August, from the 28th to the 30th, Robert E. Lee had managed to drive out the Union Army of General John Pope in the Second Battle of Bull Run. Thanks to Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and Major General James Longstreet, the Northern Army was defeated due to heavy artillery, strategic flanking, and successful counterattacks. 
Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia were becoming a legendary name and a symbol of hope for the CSA. After Robert E. Lee had driven the North out of the Confederacy, he planned to take a double offensive against the Union, where he would start an invasion of his own in order to take Louisville, Kentucky, and leave Indiana and Ohio open for his army. Lee sent General Braxton Bragg to invade Kentucky. This resulted in the Battle of Perryville in Boyle County, Kentucky on October 8, 1862. While the Confederacy seemed successful at first, mistakes on Bragg's part and the fact that the rebel forces fell short on supplies led the Union Army to successfully stand their ground and pursue their southern enemies until they finally retreated back to Tennessee. Though, a larger defeat for the Confederacy occurred about a month before the defeat at Perryville. When McClellan found out about Lee's offensive against the North, he took an army of over 70,000 men ready to attack. Lee and McClellan met at Washington County near Sharpsburg, Maryland, and this erupted into the Battle of Antietam. On September 17, 1862, both sides kept on gaining different upper hands by capturing bridges and successfully flanking forces, which resulted in the bloodiest single day in American history. While not the most destructive battle of the war overall, this battle that began and ended on the 17th of September saw the most people die in a single day. Over 22,000 casualties were reported, including 3,600 people who died. One of the survivors of this carnage, who I will be talking about later was a second lieutenant named Robert Gould Shaw. While McClellan did successfully repel Lee's invasion, he did not maneuver to finish off the Confederate army as it fell back. Fed up with his failure to crush the rebel armies, President Lincoln replaced McClellan with General Ambrose Everett Burnside. Burnside planned for another assault against Richmond, but this too ended in another disaster known as the Battle of Fredericksburg, which took place in Spotsylvania and Fredericksburg County in Virginia from December 11th to December 15th, 1862. Due to delays, Burnside's army suffered heavy losses as they tried to cross the Rappahannock River and faced heavy resistance from Confederate armies led by Lee and Stonewall. The Union's casualties were practically twice as much as the South's, with over 12,000 casualties and 600 men dead. Burnside was relieved after this mess of an invasion. As 1863 began, Ulysses Grant proved his competence and success as a general back in the Western Theater with his Siege of Vicksburg. While he failed to take the Mississippian town by the beginning of the year, he later met with the Army of Tennessee, determined to break the South's communication with the far west of the Confederacy. On May 14th, the Siege of Vicksburg began. After Grant saw that his direct attacks were failing, he pursued a tactic of cutting off communication from the interior in order to attack the city. While this was going on, in Spotsylvania County in Virginia from April 30th to May 6, 1863, the Battle of Chancellorsville took place. Burnside's successor to the Union Army, Joseph Hooker, faced off against both Lee and Jackson after northern forces tried to attack supply lines. Lee faced off against an army more than twice the size of his own. However, Lee was amazingly able to use tactics to divide his enemy's army and successfully win the battle for the Confederacy. This, combined with Hooker's timid decision-making, meant that Lee won what some call his perfect battle, but he paid a huge price. He lost over 1,600 men, and, unfortunately for the South, Stonewall Jackson was accidentally shot through friendly fire. He survived his wounds after going through an amputation, but died four days later after the battle ended, due to pneumonia. With his death, Lee had lost his right-hand man, and the South had lost one of its best generals. Moving back to the Siege of Vicksburg, the battle ended on July 4th, 1863, Independence Day. Despite being low on supplies, as the battle continued, Grant was finally able to hold out until the rebels surrendered, and the Union had control over the Mississippi River, dividing the CSA in two. However, a day before the siege concluded, an even bigger battle also ended. This is the biggest and bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. This battle was the true turning point for the war.
it was a battle that was the high point of the entire war in general. This was the Battle of Gettysburg. As Robert E. Lee took advantage of his numerous victories against the Union, he led his Army of Northern Virginia into Pennsylvania, invading the North. Originally, the battle was never planned, but instead happened due to forces from both sides needing shoes for their men. Gettysburg, a small town in southern Pennsylvania, was a place in mind for the Union and Confederacy to stock up on supplies, but instead, when Lee and Union General George Meade's Army of the Potomac met west of the city, it erupted into the deciding point as to whether or not Lee would be able to carry his men into the capital or not. The battle lasted for three days, and by cutting off communications and taking advantage of poor decisions made by Union leaders, the Confederacy seemed to be successful at first. But U.S. troops formed a long line of defense along the higher hills, which some historians refer to as Meade's Fish Hook. They were able to successfully defend this fish hook by using heavy artillery and forming well-protected trenches in the forests of the hill, even protecting them through the nights. However, the third day saw what is perhaps the most famous military maneuver in the entire Civil War. With one last chance to break the defenses set by the Union, Lee sent General George Edward Pickett's men across the fields and Emmitsburg Road in order to split the enemy in two. The Confederates used their artillery against the Union's cannons overlooking the fields so that they could send their men safely across in order to attack. The cannon fire battle against the Union and the Confederacy could be heard as far away as Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the capital of the state. But, after counterattacking the rebels' fire, northern forces decided to stop firing their cannons to make it seem as if their artillery was being quelled in order to lure southern troops out into the field and begin a barrage against them as they marched. The trap worked, and as the southern army crossed the fields, cannon and rifle fire caused Lee and Pickett's men to suffer 6,000 casualties in the charge alone. In one famous instance, as the Confederates crossed the fence nearing the Union line, Brigadier General Lewis Addison Armistead put his hat on his sword and asked the men he was leading, who will come with me? The point at which he and the South finally came into contact with Northern soldiers is known as the high watermark of the Confederacy, for it was the farthest north the South ever got and the closest Lee got to victory. The charge, also known as Pickett's Charge, failed, and the Union won the Battle of Gettysburg. In the battle, over 5,800 soldiers died, and over 56,000 casualties occurred from this bloodbath. Robert E. Lee's army would never really recover from this defeat, nor would the Confederate army in general. The southern invasion of the north had failed. Two weeks later, another battle took place at Fort Wagner in South Carolina. This one, however, many people do not know. Remember Robert Goldshaw who fought in the Battle of Antietam? After the battle, Goldshaw became the commander of the Massachusetts 54th Volunteer Infantry, one of the first infantries where African Americans could volunteer to fight in the war. After surviving through the troubles of racism and injustice, Robert Goldshaw and his soldiers grew to 1,100 men in size, and after quelling small-scale southern battles, the 54th went up against a Confederate fort. After a failed attack on the beach fort earlier in the summer of 1863 on Morris Island in South Carolina, Shaw and his men attacked Fort Wagner as part of a campaign to attack southern coastal defenses in order to attack major ports of the CSA. He and his men would fight as heroes, whether they won or lost. Shaw, along with other Union leaders, led the 54th across a narrow strip of land to Morris Island to attack on July 18, 1863. After sunset, Shaw led his men up the hill to a fort heavily defended by gunfire and artillery. On the way up, according to witnesses, Robert Gould Shaw was shot in the chest and was killed instantly. While the infantry were able to reach the parapet of the fort, a lack of reinforcements and the fact Shaw's men were outmatched led to an unfortunate Confederate victory. 
the Union attack against Fort Wagner had failed. Shaw and his men were buried in a mass grave not too far away from the fort, which ironically caused the fort's water supply to become poisoned, forcing the Confederates to abandon the stronghold shortly after the battle. Thanks to films such as Glory and the preservation of Shaw's letters, he and his men of the 54th are now considered war heroes, martyrs who were not afraid to go up against certain death, proving that freed slaves could become brave and determined soldiers more than willing to release their brethren in the south of their chains. In one legendary historical event, William Harvey Kearney, a Union sergeant who fought and survived in the Battle of Fort Wagner, became the first African American to be awarded the the Medal of Honor. In central Tennessee, after Union forces forced General Bragg out of the town of Chattanooga, a battle followed called the Battle of Chickamauga, which took place in Catoosa and Walker County in Georgia. From September 19th to September 20th, 1863, due to misinformation on the Union side, the Northern Army accidentally created a gap in their line of defense, causing the U.S. to retreat back to Tennessee. It was a very significant defeat for the Union at the time, but a little over a month later, Grant rooted Bragg's forces from eastern Tennessee. As 1864 began, General Ulysses Grant was put in charge of all Union armies. In March, he and Meade launched a new offensive in another attempt to take Richmond, but surprisingly, even under his command, this plan still proved to be a major obstacle. From May 5th to May 6th of the year, the Battle of the Wilderness took place. Back at Spotsylvania County and Orange County, Virginia, Grant and Meade faced off against Lee when the Union Army was trying to maneuver through the dense woods of the state. Through a series of attacks and surprise flankings, Grant eventually directed his army away from the battle, hoping to avoid further conflict as his casualties neared 18,000 as the battle progressed. This then led to the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, which lasted from May 8th to May 21st, almost two weeks. Here, Grant attempted to engage Lee under more favorable conditions, but with his attacks unable to successfully dislodge Lee, he disengaged the Army of Northern Virginia again after suffering even worse losses, and this then led to another major battle that was also inconclusive. The Battle of North Anna took place from May 23rd to May 26th in Caroline and Hanover County. As Grant tried to lure Lee's army into open terrain, he and Meade forded the North Anna River, but Lee replied with a trap to split the Union army in two. Grant fell into this trap, but Lee became disabled with an intestinal illness, and further orders from the Confederate leadership were unable to be executed. Grant and Meade would then suffer a terrible loss at the Battle of Cold Harbor at Hanover County from May 31st to June 12th. Just 10 miles north of Richmond, the Union had captured the crossroads of Cold Harbor, and both sides later received reinforcements after suffering heavy casualties from the previous battles. The Union's attempts to defeat the rebels were unsuccessful, and Grant's army stood in the face of a hopeless battle, as a series of Confederate fortifications seven miles long repelled anything Grant could throw at them. It is said that in this battle, Grant's army suffered 6,000 casualties in less than an hour. The North suffered over 12,000 casualties total and lost nearly 2,000 men in the struggle. Despite these losses, Grant and Meade would still lead a successful campaign during the Siege of Petersburg. For over nine months, from June 9, 1864 to March 25, 1865, while it was not a siege for the most part, in at least a traditional sense of a military attack, the Union launched a series of successful attacks against the rebels, which involved the use of trench warfare to to capture the Virginia capital, which was vital in supplying Lee's army. Petersburg was also located just 25 miles away from Richmond. The final part of this campaign ended in late March, and the true siege began when Lee's army was finally defeated, which would later lead to his final surrender. While this was going on, in the Western Campaign, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman invaded Georgia with an amassed army numbering over 100,000. General Joseph Johnson faced off against Sherman in the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain on June 27, 1864 in Cobb County, Georgia. While Sherman's tactics to defeat the Confederate fortifications in order to advance his invasion had failed, the Confederate army still felt threatened and fell back to Atlanta, the state's capital. Johnston was replaced by John Bell Hood, 
At the Battle of Franklin, Hood invaded Tennessee, and at Frank Williamson County on November 30th, 1864, the Confederacy lost in a disastrous assault. Union fortifications dealt extreme casualties to the rebels, including 14 generals, with over 6,000 casualties and over 1,700 soldiers dead, the Army of Tennessee retreated back with barely half of its men. Afterwards, Sherman marched through Georgia, practically unopposed, in his famous march to the sea. During this march, Sherman and his army pursued a scorched earth strategy, more well known as a total war strategy, which meant destroying everything and anything useful to the enemy. Targets of this march included civilian property, plantations, industry, and infrastructure, in order to decimate the deep south to deal major damage to the Confederacy. Some say that tactics like this make war look so terrible, horrific, and traumatic that that the enemy will feel as if they have no choice but to surrender. The march lasted from November 15th to December 21st, 1864, and ended as Sherman finished his path of destruction at Savannah, Georgia, occupying the city. While Sherman was marching through Georgia, the Battle of Nashville took place from December 15th to December 16th, 1864, in Davidson County, Tennessee. Hood's Army of Tennessee was mostly destroyed due to aggressive Union attacks. As 1865 began, it was clear that the Confederacy was on its last legs. Due to the capture of the Mississippi River, the Siege of Peterburg's success, the defeat of Lee's army, and the march to the sea, the Confederacy was split into three, as Union forces occupied lands in Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and Northern Virginia. Robert E. Lee evacuated Richmond as Petersburg fell, and headed south to North Carolina in an attempt to meet up with John Johnston's forces. However, the checkmate of the Army of Northern Virginia occurred on April 9, 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse in Central Virginia. Lee's retreat was cut off by Union forces, and after a short battle, Lee knew in order to prevent the complete annihilation of his army, he had to surrender. Ulysses Simpson Grant and Robert E. Lee met within the house of a grocer, William McLean, and Lee signed the surrender documents. After Lee's defeat, and the conclusion of the war, Ulysses Simpson Grant would go on to become the 18th President of the United States from 1868 to 1876. Shortly after Lee's surrender, Joseph Johnston had no choice but to meet up with Sherman after realizing Lee had been defeated and that he could no longer continue President Davis's wish to keep the fighting going. At Bennett Place, near Greensboro, North Carolina, Sherman had successfully driven Johnston into a corner because he invaded the Carolinas after his march. From April 24th to April 26th, 1865, Grant and Sherman made negotiations with Johnston, and by the end of the month, the Confederate general surrendered. Johnston's surrender ended the war for nearly 90,000 soldiers from southern states. It is the largest surrender of the Civil War. While other armies and pockets of rebel soldiers and commanders did not surrender as late as the end of 1865, due to the lack of instant communication about the defeats in Appomattox and Bennett at the time, by the end of April, the bloodshed was clearly and finally over. The Union had defeated the Confederacy. Throughout the war, new tools for destruction were used in some of the most damaging ways possible. Rifles, even if most still required ramrods and external gunpowder in order to be reloaded, were more efficient and accurate than the ones used to fight against Britain 90 years ago. Thanks to Connecticut industrialist Samuel Colt, the North was able to take advantage of one of the first weapons that could be fired repeatedly without the need to reload, the revolver. Repeater rifles also saw heavy use during the Civil War, which showed many armies a new look at what types of guns would replace the single-shot muskets. Guns in the Civil War also used the infamous bullet known as the mini-ball, which was capable of greater range than most bullets and could splinter bone more efficiently on impact and make infection more likely. Cannons are also a symbol used for the entire American Civil War in general. Not only were the ones used in the Civil War capable of better range and impact than the ones used in the Revolution, but different types of ammunition such as the canister shot could deal extraordinary amounts of carnage in the blink of an eye. Cannons used in the Civil War could fire nearly 30 small iron balls over a short range that could transform artillery into giant shotguns that could mow down 10 men with one well-placed shot. Medicine was also an important thing in the Civil War. 
While knowledge and technology to care for the wounded was much better than it was in the revolution, medicine was still in its infancy. Amputations were slow and agonizing, as painkillers were not nearly as advanced as they are today. Many doctors didn't even clean their tools when operating. As many already know, more people in the war died from a result of infection and sickness rather than direct wounds. However, due to all of this misery, women were able to show their effectiveness at a time when they could not enlist in the military. They did this by caring for the sick. Inspired by the legacy of modern nursing thanks to Florence Nightingale and the Crimean War, many women became nurses. One prominent nurse, who also worked as a teacher, was Clara Barton, who went on to found the American Red Cross in 1881. Women were also vital in supplying their armies with various necessities such as food and clothing. It is estimated that 400 women disguised themselves as Union and Confederate soldiers to fight for their countries. In the end, the Union's path to victory against the Confederacy was a long, complicated, strange, tragic, and bloody legend of history that resulted in the deaths of over 600,000 people at the very least and over 850,000 at the very most. Then, there is the other side of the war. That was the war that people like Lincoln fought, not just in Washington, but across the Union and the Confederacy. Starting his presidency, Lincoln was already running a sour campaign for many, because a war being fought with his army that many thought would last 90 days had ballooned to months of bloody armed struggle. Racism was also a problem as he entered into presidential power. Strong conservative sentiments from Democratic representatives in Congress still viewed African Americans as unequal beings to white people. At first, Lincoln's main goal when the war broke out was to preserve the Union and stop a bad precedent for the future of a nation, that if any state had extreme disagreements with the United States, it could just secede and leave. With all these problems, Lincoln suffered through much trouble. His re-election campaign in 1864 would prove to be a huge obstacle if the war did not end by then, and his new goal of abolishing slavery as the conflict continued was unpopular to many people in his own administration, because some believed that the CSA would never accept themselves back into the Union, only to find out that forced servitude had been completely outlawed, thus destroying the entire Southern economy. Despite all of this, Lincoln continued with the war and his political platform, and possibly his most well-known action in his entire presidency, on January 1st, 1863, he issued the executive order known as the Emancipation Proclamation. This war measure was not passed by Congress, though it is still seen as an effective action of the Lincoln administration to end slavery because it proclaimed the abolishment of forced servitude in all portions of the United States, not under Union control. In other words, this proclamation was a statement that slavery was to be banned in the Confederacy. Though contrary to popular belief, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free a single slave due to the fact it was only an executive order passed as more of a proposal rather than an actual law. However, it was still a legendary event in the course of the war and American history because it now defined the struggle between the two powers as a battle to end slavery more than preserving the Union. It also stated that free men could now enlist in paid services in the U.S. Army and that the freedom of all ex-slaves must be recognized. The Emancipation Proclamation would be imperative to the creation of black regiments in the Union Army, such as the previously mentioned 54th Massachusetts Regiment, Though the first regiment of escaped slaves was the 1st South Carolina Volunteers, which consisted of runaway men from the CSA. As 1863 progressed, battles such as the 54th's defeat at Fort Wagner would help spread the word about the bravery of black soldiers and their martyrdom, which helped encourage others to join the Union Army to free all men from Confederate tyranny. Lincoln credited men such as these for helping turn the tide of the war. By 1863, as the war swung in the favor of the Union, plans to craft an amendment to abolish slavery were drummed up by Representative James Mitchell Ashley. It would later evolve into the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. 
Republicans, both moderate and radical, supported the amendment in order to end what they viewed as an unjust form of cruel and miserable forced servitude, while Democrats were largely against it due to their favor of states' rights and anti-federal sentiments. Debates would continue, but eventually, in April of 1864, the Senate passed the amendment, with a vote of 38 to 16, but just two months later, it would fail to pass in the House of Representatives, failing to achieve a two-thirds majority. Lincoln thought that after the war ended, his Emancipation Proclamation would fail to be relevant to all Confederate states after they had been readmitted into the United States. He saw an amendment as the permanent solution to the problem, because in early 1863 he failed to arrange an agreement with southern states to end the war and come back to the U.S. with no penalties if they abolished slavery and collected loyalty oaths. The 13th Amendment seemed to be a solution where, as long as the war ended and the southern states were readmitted, slavery would end everywhere, no matter what. On November 9, 1863, Abraham Lincoln attended the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, after the famous battle. There, he delivered what could be the most well-known speech ever given by an American. The speech was very short, and lasted for only two minutes, but every last word that was read off of it is considered to be just as poetic and impressive as the founding documents for the nation. This was Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Lincoln unfortunately had to worry about re-election throughout 1864. At first, many thought he would face tough opposition from his Democratic candidate, who was nonetheless his ex-commander of the Union Army, George McClellan. McClellan mostly ran on a platform of peace to end the war soon and negotiate with the Confederacy. However, a series of strong victories for the Union made Abraham Lincoln look like a successful commander-in-chief and leader who was able to lead an effective campaign against the rebellious states while pursuing a staunch abolitionist platform. This would prove to be useful against the campaign of McClellan, who did have that great of a record as an unsuccessful general during the early years of the war. On November 8th, 1864, Abraham Lincoln won his re-election in a landslide, with over 2.2 million votes against McClellan's 1.8 million. He won 212 electoral votes. McClellan only won 21 and carried just three states, Kentucky, Delaware, and his home state of New Jersey. After Lincoln won, he made the abolishment of slavery through the 13th Amendment his top presidential priority. He had more confidence in it, seeing that the majority of the population supported the notion of ending slavery. Lincoln did his best to appeal to Democratic candidates, many of whom had not been re-elected in November. Briberies were made, mostly due to the Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, and while hope for the amendment's passage always seemed to be challenged by pro-slavery reactionaries, confidence for the abolishment of forced servitude still grew as 1865 began. Finally, 
On January 31, 1865, the 13th Amendment passed by a vote of 119 to 56, little over the two-thirds majority needed. Many supporters of this amendment, including black onlookers from above the House floor, erupted into cheer. As time progressed, and the Confederate States were readmitted into the Union, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution would be ratified state by state, ending the plague of slavery from the U.S. While blacks living in America would continue to face the unjust forces of suppression, discrimination, and violence, even to this day, the passage of this amendment would be a vital event for all races in America to fight for liberty and justice for all. Unfortunately, for the man who made all of this possible, he would not be able to look over the reconstruction of his country after the war ended. Lincoln stated that he was willing to let the Confederacy back into the U.S. with little to no penalties, seeing as how slavery was abolished and their economy would already be in ruins. The war had already caused so much destruction. Destruction. Then, tragedy struck. Five days after Lee's surrender to Grant, and twelve days before Johnston's surrender to Sherman, on the night of April 14, 1865, Abraham Lincoln and his wife Mary Todd attended the play Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Abraham Lincoln was shot in the back of the head by an American stage actor and Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. Booth would later be tracked down, shot, and killed by a Union soldier while hiding in a barn he set on fire in his attempt to flee to southern Maryland. The next day, on April 15, 1865, Abraham Lincoln died. The entire nation mourned the loss of their president, and he was laid to rest in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois, at Oak Ridge Cemetery. Lincoln left an outstanding legacy for the history of the United States of America. His leadership through the Civil War, his efforts to end slavery, and his persistence to achieve his goals to lead the nation through one of the worst conflicts the country has ever faced has earned him the title as one of the best presidents of all time. Though not all of the success was due to the Lincoln administration, other people also played big roles in freeing slaves and helping the Union with the war. In addition to the previously mentioned figures of Robert Gould Shaw and Clara Barton, many freed slaves went on to become heroes for the U.S. before the war even began. One of the most well-known of these other heroes was Araminta Ross, also known as Harriet Tubman, a woman who was born into slavery in Maryland but escaped to safety in Pennsylvania. She then went on to lead many missions to rescue slaves by bringing them from their homelands to the northern states. It is estimated that Tubman rescued approximately seven families in her missions. She is perhaps the most well-known figure of the Underground Railroad, which was a network of secret safe houses and routes used by slaves to escape to the north. Harriet Tubman also assisted John Brown in recruiting men for his raid on Harper's Ferry, and went on to be an advocate for women's rights during the American suffrage movement. Though another person that must be brought up when discussing the war is Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, better known as Frederick Douglass. Douglass was an escaped slave also from Maryland, who went on to become a social reformer, writer, abolitionist, statesman, and a huge symbol for the fight to end slavery. Douglass represented the proof that black people were perfectly capable of becoming just as civilized, responsible, and intelligent as any other person in society, given that they were treated equally as white men in the nation. He wrote many autobiographies, and he detailed his life as a slave. He described slavery as a cruel way of life that required excessive dehumanization and intimidation in order to stop revolt. Douglas said that the system made him so disconnected from his own family, he didn't feel anything when his own parents died. Douglas also stated, after traveling to Britain in 1845, that any argument that slavery was needed to keep economies from collapsing was untrue, seeing as how the UK had abolished it in 1833, but was still able to function well as a Western nation. Douglas even once met up with John Brown two months before his raid, and refused to partake because he believed the attack would only anger the American public and prove to be a failure. He went on to support women's rights before his death, and believed that any person, regardless of skin color, gender, country of origin, etc., was born equally to everybody else.
The creation of the state of West Virginia was actually a product of Civil War turmoil. After Virginia seceded from the U.S., the western portion of the state saw disagreements with the more eastern and southern areas due to political apparitionment and the issue of slavery. This ultimately resulted in the secession of the western part of the state, which became West Virginia, and on June 20th, 1863, the state was admitted into the Union as the 35th state to the U.S. Though it was a border state, as it remained loyal to the Union, but still accepted slavery. Britain is also mentioned by some people when discussing foreign involvement in the war. While Britain remained neutral throughout the conflict, it is said that elites in the European country favored the Confederates, while public opinion favored the Union. Slavery had been banned in the UK 32 years before it was outlawed in the US, though the country never directly supported the North or the South. The Civil War remains to be one of the most important conflicts the U.S., and the world for that matter, ever saw. Due to this bloodshed, the U.S. had survived, and slavery was finally abolished. The freedoms that were never delivered to the public during the Revolution were finally given to men during the battle between the Union and the Confederacy. It saw the great divisions in America's own people through political turmoil and fierce battle. Some of the nation's most treasured heroes, whether or not they are well known, made their marks on U.S. history, and warfare saw a drastic increase in power and brutality. Cannons mowing down countless men in an instant, lines of fire bringing some of the country's most tough and rugged farmers to the ground, and disease wiping out entire towns of people at times. Medicine started to emerge in order to really treat the sick, even if the methods to utilize it were very primitive. The Civil War includes both America's bloodiest day and America's largest battle. Some of the best generals in U.S. history were put to the test against each other, while men of abolition were finally trying to end slavery that had been troubling the nation for decades. The war's causes are still debated, along with the morality of the people who helped start it. The Reconstruction Era began immediately after the war, which would take years of work to repair a devastated nation, especially in the South. Not everything was perfect for the men who fought for their freedom after the war. The Ku Klux Klan would begin its reign of terror in the late 1800s, and Jim Crow laws would start a separate and unequal system of segregation that placed African Americans in inferior living conditions, which led to more work having to be done in the civil rights movement almost a century later. The nation still sees the effects of the war to this day, whether it is debates over the rights of groups of people, the strong political divide between the North and the South, or the families who still have pictures from the war in their houses, even to this day. Recreations and reenactments of battles, houses, and other events from the Civil War take place every year. The war has also made an enormous impact on our books, television shows, movies, and other forms of media. The Civil War serves as the basis for the story of Victor Fleming's romantic epic Gone with the Wind, Edward Zwick's classic war drama Glory, the 1993 film Gettysburg, and Stephen Crane's classic 1895 novel The Red Badge of Courage. Actors such as Matthew Broderick, Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, Carrie Ewells, Martin Sheen, Jeff Daniels, Tommy Lee Jones, Daniel Day-Lewis, and more have all played major figures in the Civil War on film as well. It has been 150 years since this monumental struggle ended. So, for the occasion, ask yourself, what does the American Civil War mean to me? <laughs> Present arms. Eyes. Oh, he's talking about the reenactions. I'm talking about the 